Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate the privilege and the honor of standing here, standing in this place. Um, I found out pretty pretty quick that following in the footsteps of some people that I look up to, one is uh, my uncle, Philip Rogers. He, I think he preached here before, and then particularly Brother Laird was here, I think, for several years, and I really admire and look up to him. It's no accident that we are preaching, that we are meeting together on the first day of the week. We believe in the resurrection, and today I want to talk to you, I want to preach to you about Jesus and the resurrection. If you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2. While you're turning there, I'm going to just quote Romans 14. says, For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and living. Here in the book of John, chapter 2, Jesus is just getting his ministry started. And you probably remember the story of the... Of the uh, Wedding there, Cain of Galilee, and the unusual event that happened where Jesus took water and turned it to wine. And that picture there of the wine is a picture of joy, joy uh, and of marriage, joy of reunion, joy of communion, joy of. Uh, Rejoicing in the, you know, in the, um, the forming of this new family. But I want to pick up in, in verse 11 and read down to the end of the chapter, if you will, with me. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, and down to the end of the chapter. It said, Jesus performed this first sign in Cain of Galilee. He displayed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they stayed there only a few days. The Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple complex, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves. He also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple complex with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those that were selling doves, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews replied to him, What sign of authority will you show us for doing these things. Jesus answered, Destroy this sanctuary, and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore the Jews said, This sanctuary took 46 years to build, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the sanctuary of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. While he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many trusted in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them, since he knew them all, and because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Let's pray again. Father, this morning as we look at your word, would you speak to us? Would you cause us to enter into the words and the sense? Would you send your Holy Spirit to give us not only understanding, but also grace to put it to practice in our lives? We ask these things, may you be lifted up as Lord, and may we be revived with the power of your resurrection. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We 
We see three major movements here in, in this passage. And I'm going to focus on the response of his disciples. The response of his disciples. But first, let's look at a little bit of background. So, Jesus is just getting um, started. Verse 11 tells us this was his first sign or miracle. And the, the miracles were given as signs, as a signal um, and evidence of him being who he said he was. We know the book of John was written for a specific purpose. John, at the very end, chapter 20, verse 21, says that these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life in his name. And so when we look at the book of John, John could have written a lot of things. Um, and in fact, he said if we wrote everything that Jesus did, he said that heaven and earth couldn't hold all the books that were written about it. But John picked and chose some specific things that he wanted to deal with. Now keep in mind, um, God gave us four Gospels. God gave us four accounts of the life of Christ. And also a few other details thrown in in the epistles of Paul that were given to him by Revelation. And so these eyewitnesses each told the story from their own viewpoint. And John, um, evidently, it, the tradition is that he wrote his book um, towards the end of his life. When he was about 80 or 90 years old, after the destruction of Jerusalem, after the temple had been destroyed, after the people had been um, evacuated from Jerusalem, after he himself was in prison um, on a little island off the coast of Asia Minor, um, same place where he wrote the book of Revelation. And he's thinking back, as an old man, he's thinking back. Now, according to tradition, he was the youngest disciple um, during the ministry of Jesus Christ probably hardly more than a teenager. And yet, um, he walked. He had the privilege of walking with the Lord and then going on and, and live, leading a full ministry within, um, uh, within the ministry that God had called him to there as an apostle of the Lord. So, John selected some specific accounts and one of the things that he focused on here was some specific miracles that showed that Jesus was the Son of God, was who he said he was. Now, I want to help you, us build just a little bit of chronology. If you would, just kind of go with me in your mind. Um, the book of John revolves around basically... Three different events, and each one of them is a Passover. So Jesus' ministry lasted three years. Um, there were mostly it was um, it was for sure all of, um, always the 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 happenings there, except for this one there at Cana. But the the vast bulk of what John talks about. It's just these little vignettes, these little snippets of Jesus during the um, during the Passover, and you can you can kind of trace it um, there in chapter five. It goes five, six, seven. Um, then you get to a, 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 another one, eight, nine, ten, and then you get to the very last one, right? Uh, Eleven, twelve, all the way to chapter eighteen. I mean, chapter twenty. Um, around the Passover in which he himself died. So, there's a lot of talking, a lot of Jesus preaching in the book of John, and they revolve around this, these, um, these periods in which um, they were at Jerusalem. But, before, before that, 
Um, it gives us a few little clues here about um, what had happened. Um, the end of chapter 1 tells us how he had called his first disciples. He was walking um, there. Um, actually, I, I, I take that back. He, he came, he approached John the Baptist. He was baptized. He went out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and he came back. And so in chapter 1, whenever John <coughs> sees Jesus coming out of the wilderness to begin his ministry, John says, you know, I, I was sent, I'm not the one, but I was sent to bear witness of the one. And he said, I didn't know who he was, but I saw him whenever the heavens opened and the uh, dove descended on him and filled him with the Holy Ghost. Luke tells us that he went in the full spirit of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and he came back out of the wilderness full of the Holy Spirit. The time in the wilderness did not diminish or alter even though he faced the, that severe Temptation by the devil. It did not alter the fact that he was full of the Holy Spirit going out and coming back. And so as he's approaching, coming back out of the um, out of the wilderness, John gives his testimony, and some of John's disciples prick up their ears and say, Ah, that's the one. And they come up to Jesus and say, Master, where are you saved? He says, Come and see. And so Peter. He goes and gets Andrew. I'm sorry, Andrew goes and gets Peter. I got that backwards. Um, then Philip and Nathaniel, James and John, uh, and you see them begin to follow. That's now. What were they doing there? Um, if, if you can follow the chronology. Jesus was probably baptized in October um, of the year. He went out into the wilderness for 40 days, came back, puts it down on the first part of December. His disciples joined him. They go back up to uh, the north, back up to Galilee. And it says here in verse 12, in our chapter, chapter 2, verse 12, it says, After this he went down to Capernaum, together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they stayed there only a few days. So from December to March, basically, was the time that he was in Capernaum, and he led um, his first Galilean ministry. If we, if we compare to um, Matthew... That was probably the time in which he presented the, the Sermon on the Mount, which he was given that first intensive indoctrination to the, his disciples of what is the principles of the kingdom of God. What is, um, what is it that we are all about? And to kick it off, he had, he had joined into a community event. He'd gone to this wedding. As, as I talked about a minute ago, um, he turned the water to wine, and his disciples, notice their response there in verse 11 again. It said, Jesus performed his first sign, his first miracle in Cain of Galilee. He displayed his glory. John uh, started out his, chap his book in John chapter 1 saying, We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus displayed his glory. What was the result? His disciples believed in him. Now we're going to, um, this, this passage kind of develops for us this idea of belief. What does it mean to believe? Do we believe only when we see a miracle? What does it mean for us to believe? And so, um, 
after he had spent this um, small amount of time there in Capernaum, intensive teaching, preaching, there along the, uh, along the shores there in Capernaum, right? We have the, the story of, of him. There was so much, such a crowd that he got into a boat and was pushed out. And that water formed this natural amphitheater that um, projected his voice. And he was preaching to these uh, thousands of people on the shore. He was doing his father's business. He was teaching the word. He was presenting the principles of who he was. And, and remember when, I, when we started, who is he? He is Lord. Right? He died and revived and resurrected so that he might be Lord. He pressed his claim of lordship upon his disciples. And so when it says that they believed him, to be a disciple is to acknowledge him as Lord, Master, Boss. Um, but in, in a very close and intimate way in which, you know, I am going to spend my life living out the principles that you've given to me. I am going to dedicate myself to following in your footsteps. His disciples believed in him. So after a few days, it says a few days there, you know, um, a, a, a period there, an un unspecified period, the Jews' Passover was near, it was approaching the part, of the, um, the part of, in March in which the Passover is celebrated Easter, and Jesus prepared as was appropriate, right, all the, all the Jewish males were required to appear before the temple at least three times a year. And one of them was in the fall, um, the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is where he first uh, was baptized, and now here um, in the Passover, in the spring, and then the next one would be after 50 days of the day of Pentecost. So he, um, he is, the, the Passover is approaching, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he took charge in the temple. We have this um, story that makes me laugh. You know, I, I, I get a kick out of um, seeing this picture. Jesus took some short cords, you know, some, maybe it's 550, I don't know, something like that. And he, and he makes three or four, and he starts, you know, he starts rounding up the cows, the sheep. The, the pigeons, the doves, whatever, and running them out, to, around, running them out of, of the, the precinct there. Starts kicking over tables. He says, this isn't a marketplace. And um, we know from, some, from uh, some scholars, they believe that the area that had been filled up with this market was actually what was called the court of the Gentiles. It was where... People from every nation, they weren't allowed into the holy place, but they were allowed in this courtyard here where they could come and they could pray and they could recognize who the God of Israel was and they could come uh, approach to him and they could hear the word and his message is a gracious message, it's a missionary message, it's a message in which he's asking us to come and to be with him. And this is the area that was completely overrun with merchandise, with people making a buck. I hope that doesn't happen to our churches. I hope we never see church as an opportunity to make a buck. told those selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. In verse 17, what was his disciples' reaction there? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house 
will consume you. So that's a quote from uh, Psalm 69. Let's take a look at that for just a minute. I'm just going to read it uh, again in, in Psalms. It's important for us to have committed to memory the Word of God. It's important for the Word of God to have such a hold in our lives that whenever life happens, we see it in the context of his word. In Psalm uh, 69, we have a, a real struggle here. I'm just going to read the first nine verses and, and stop. Um, the psalmist here in Psalm 69 says, Save me, God, for water has risen to my neck. I have sunk in deep mud, and there's no footing. I have come into deep waters, and a flood sweeps over me. I'm weary from my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without cause are more numerous than the hairs of my head. My deceitful enemies who would destroy me are powerful. Though I did not steal, I must repay. God, you know my foolishness and my guilty acts are not hidden from you. Do not let those who put their hope in you be disgraced because of me, Lord God of hosts. Do not let those who seek you be humiliated because of me, God of Israel. For I have endured insults because of you, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and a foreigner to my mother's sons, because zeal for your house has consumed me, and the insults of those who insulted you have fallen on me. So, it, while this story is, um, is a autobiographical of David, right? He was very zealous for the Lord, right? He stood up and stepped out and went for the giant Goliath. And his brother said, oh, he's, um, what is it? He's a naughty boy, right? He is um, just coming down to see the battle. He's trying to get into mischief. And he felt very personally that shame of his brothers making fun of him. But he actually showed up for what God had called him to do. Right? Whenever he attacked Goliath, he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel so that all the nations may know that there's a God in Israel. So that the nations may know. That was autobiographical for David, but it's also representative of the Son of David, of Jesus Christ. When, the, when these disciples, when John and James and Peter and Andrew got to talk afterwards, he said, did you see what he did? Yeah, what does that make you think of? Yeah, it makes me think of Psalm 69. The zeal of your house has consumed me. I take personally what they're doing in your house. I take personally how they have turned God's house into a marketplace. I take personally when people use God, when people use the Bible, when people use religion, when people use church for their own purposes, for their own pride, for their own profit. And of course, who was threatened by this act? So going back to John chapter 2, we see that the Jews, it, it, it just gives a, a generic term, whether it was the Pharisees or the, or the Levites or the priests or whoever it was, it says the Jews um, came up to him and says, what's your authority? What did, what, what, what did Jesus claim was his authority? He says, my father's house. He told you what his authority was. I'm the son of God. This is my father's house. I am taking 
charge here, that was a threat. That was a, a statement uh, about who he was. And the Jews didn't like it. You know, this is our, this is our playhouse. This is our marketplace. But... So you saw the, the disciples saw the sign, saw the miracle, believed in him, that he was who he said he was. They recognized the word of God taking place right before their eyes. They recognized prophecy being fulfilled. At that moment, they saw Psalm 69 come to life right in front of their eyes as Jesus took charge in the temple. Jesus' sense of justice, our sense of justice, is different than the world's sense of justice. So they, the Jews were interested in the power, right? They wanted to see a sign. He says, okay, if you are who you say you are, show us a sign. It wasn't that Jesus hadn't shown signs, right? Um, but his sign, it, how can I put this? His signs hit different for those who believed versus those who were looking for a chance not to believe. What sign of authority will you show us for doing these things? Verse 18. And Jesus gave them a sign. He's like, all right, here is your prophecy. Here's your sign. Destroy this sanctuary, and I will raise it up in three days. Then they talk about, well, this sanctuary was built in 46 years. And it's funny because there is this love-hate relationship between the Jews and Herod. Um, Herod was the king, uh, the, the autocrat over that area of Jerusalem. He served under the Roman Empire. Um, he had spent a lot of money to rebuild the temple on a very grand scale, but he was, a, a, you know, he was known to be a half-breed, for one thing. Um, he was a very uh, irreligious man, let's just put it that way. And yet he had built the temple, and the Jews gloried in this temple. Jesus? And so, what I'm trying to say is there's this mixed bag of, of, of things going on here, Jesus worshipped in that temple, right? That was the temple. He followed all of the law in that temple. But um, at the same time, God can accomplish things through, um, through means that aren't 100% aren't pristine. But the temple was never attempt, uh, in, intended to be the end all and be all. If we go back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2, all the way to the very end, Revelation 20, the end all be all was God dwelling with man. That was the purpose. That was his will. Jesus entered in wholeheartedly into what his father was accomplishing. What does Revelation 20 say? He says, the tabernacle of God is with men. That's what we're living for. That's what we long for. We sang about it. I'll fly away one of these days and get to be with him. The Jews set themselves up as judges of who was and who wasn't the people of God. Um, so let me, let's develop this just a little bit further. I've, I've still got a little bit of time. Um, let's think about Jesus as the temple. Jesus as the temple. 
He said, destroy this sanctuary, speaking of himself, speaking of his body, and I will raise it up in three days. We know in, in, in another place, in, in Luke chapter 12, he told the Jews the same thing, right? He says, y'all want a, a wicked and adulterous generation? Wants a sign? I'll give you a sign. He said, I'll give you the sign of the, of the prophet Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. We know that Jonah was a picture of the resurrection, right? I know that my Redeemer lives. Um, so... Jesus said, the, 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 the symbol I give you, the sign I give you, is what? Is resurrection. Keep that in mind, and let's look for just a minute. We're going to go to um, Hebrews chapter 10, and then Psalm 40, before we come back. Hebrews chapter 10 says... Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the actual form of those realities, when you look at the tabernacle, the tabernacle isn't the house of God. It's a shadow of the house of God, right? It was the house of God in a sense, just like this church is a house of God in a sense, but ultimately it's not the house of God because the house of God is where God is. It's only a picture for our temporary home. It's only a temporary, that's why it's a tabernacle. It's something that's going to fold up one of these days and get put away when we actually see him as he is. Hebrews 10, 2. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered since the worshippers once purified would no longer have any conscience of sins? But in the sacrifices, there is a remembrance a reminder of sins every year. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, as he was coming into the world, he says, You did not want to sacrifice an offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in the whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, See, it is written about me in the volume of the scroll, I have come to do your will, O God. After he says above, you did not want... The, or delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which are offered according to the law, he then says, See, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. But this will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So even from the very beginning, Jesus was already telling them, I have to die. I am going to die. I have my eyes set towards the cross. And after I have died and offered the ultimate sacrifice, I will rise again. So the quote here in Hebrews 10 refers back to Psalm 40. So we're going to jump back there for just a second. There's just one word um, there in Psalm 40 that uh, just gets all over me. We're going to pick up in verse 6. I'm sorry, let's pick up in verse 4. I'm going to have to back up. Well, I'm going to read the whole psalm. Psalm 41. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me out from a desolate pit out of the muddy clay, set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. How happy is the man who has put his trust in the Lord. And has not turned to the proud or to those who run after lies. Lord my God, you have done many things. Your wonderful works and your plans for us. None can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. You do not delight in sacrifice and offering. You open my ears to listen. You do not ask for a whole burnt offering or sin offering. Then I said, see, 
I have come. It is written about me in the volume of the scroll, verse 8, I delight to do your will, my God. Your instruction lives within me. Verse 9, I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. See, I do not keep my mouth closed, as you know. Now, he talks about here the great assembly. Again, another David's song. David's talking at it autobiographically. I don't know if you remember, whenever David brought the Ark of the Covenant up and finally pitched it, uh, uh, finally set it in a tent that he had pitched there on Mount Zion for it, and he danced before the Lord and he celebrated and he was so happy with what the Lord had done. God was going to come and be with him and be near him and he was going to be near the house of God. And so he was talking about the great assembly there. He unabashedly, unashamedly, ecstatically praising God in the great congregation. And that was still um, uh, prophetic because at the Last Supper, Jesus was sitting among his disciples and it says, He's, and they sang a hymn. Right? That verse, and, and again, John gives us that one in, in John chapter 4, in John chapter, uh, chap, the end of John chapter 13, when, when they had sung a hymn, they went out. That was a quote from here, Psalm, Psalm 40. He sang a hymn. Jesus Christ proclaiming himself, I am the will of God. You see, um, Whenever I was young, I would struggle and I would, and, and I would try and try to figure out how do I get in the very perfect center of God's will. And then finally I realized Jesus Christ is the center of God's will. Whenever God looked at Jesus, he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He is the perfect, um, the perfect pleasure and the fulfillment of the will of God. And as we believers are in Christ, we are in the will of God. As we are partakers with Him, as we are one with Him, as we are in unity with Him, we become um, in the full embrace of the, of the ministry and the, uh, and the work of Christ. What He accomplished on the cross is given to us 100% for our benefit. His work, His goal, His will is for us to be with Him, to be part of Him, for us to be one with Him. He's done everything that is required for us to be together with Him. He accomplished, He is accomplishing, and He will continue to accomplish until that great day what God has started. Coming back to John chapter 2, verse 21, it says, the, the disciples didn't put all the pieces together right away. They were living in prophecy. They were seeing it happen all around them. But they still could not wrap their mind around the fact, Jesus Christ has to die. Jesus has to die? How is that possible? Because they didn't fully grasp the idea of resurrection. I think that's where many of us are. We don't fully grasp the idea of resurrection. What does resurrection mean? What does it mean in the future? You know, our, I have not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the mind of, of man what God has prepared for those that love him. And we don't even understand what it means today. For the resurrection power of Christ to be in us and on us and to, and to fully revive us and to make us into his people and accomplishing his work on a daily, momently basis. We still, me, I still struggle 
to understand the resurrection. The disciples had trouble putting the pieces together. Verse 22 says, this is our third point, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. You see that progression? They saw a sign. They saw a miracle. And they believed. They saw the word lived out in front of them. And they recognized it. Jesus living out life. Living out the word of God right in front of them. The zeal of thine house hath eat me up. And then in the future, down the road, they looked back and said, that was it. They believed the scripture. In Luke chapter 16, we're told about a man who was in hell. And he wanted Lazarus to go and, tip the, uh, and touch the tip of his tongue with a drop of water. And when he couldn't have that, he says, well, go back from the dead and tell my brothers that they, so that they don't come here to this place. What did Abram say? He said they have Moses and the prophets. They have the scriptures. They have the Old Testament. They have the New Testament. He says, let them believe them. He says, no, but if someone went back from the dead, they would believe. May I tell you, we have the scriptures. We even have someone who came back from the dead. Right? Jesus Christ. And yet people still don't believe. If we are going to believe, it is through the vehicle of the scriptures that he's given us. So that we see him coming alive, coming right off the page into our lives on a daily basis. Accomplishing his work in which he is uniting man back together with God so that we might be one. So you see those three steps that his disciples went through. They believed the scripture and the statement that Jesus made. But verse 23 tells us that there were some who claimed a a belief, right? There's some that made a profession. They trusted in his names when they saw the signs, but they didn't take it any further. Right? They saw the miracles, but they didn't take it any further. Jesus, however, says, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all. And because he did not need anyone to testify about man, for he himself knew what was in man. I remember... My, um, my uncle was my pastor whenever I was a young man, and he had talked through the book of Psalms. And finally, that awareness, that understanding dawned on me. There in Psalm 27, 8 says, When the Lord said, Seek ye my face, my heart said, Thy face, Lord, do I seek. And that response was the same response that my heart had. I'm reading that verse. It was immediate just response. Yes, your face, Lord, do I see. Christ has come seeking us. Christ has come seeking you. Christ, if you know him, if you're with him, he's using you to seek others. What is your response going to be? Is it going to be, um, I want to see something? I want to see a miracle? I want to see, you know, win the lottery? I want to do this? I want to do that? Or is it going to be, Lord, I just want to be with you. I want you. I want you. Um, we're going to close in prayer, and I'll ask the song leader if you'd come and lead us in an invitation. If y'all would respond... According as the Lord lays in your heart, the, the invitation is open, the altar is open, um, or however you need to respond. Let's pray. Father, 
We confess, Lord, that we are not worthy. We don't know you like we want to know you. And Lord, we ask that you would meet us. That you would so overfill our lives that we might be true witnesses of you. We ask it in Jesus' name.